Well, for over 20 years, I worked as a software engineer. And, and one of the challenges of, of developing software is that the job never feels finished. That's why you're always getting new updates pushed to your phone or, or to your computer. There are always more features to be added, more defects to be removed, more optimizations to be made, more improvements to the documentation and to the code structure. The job is never finished. And so a software engineer is never satisfied with their work. I think that's why I, I gravitated uh, towards using my time away from work to build things with my hands. Decks and sheds and fences. Structures around the house that I could walk away from and say, look, it is finished. <laughs> there's, there's satisfaction in a job being finished. Well, today is our 35th and final Sunday in the Gospel of Mark, a study we began on, on May 29th of last year, a little over 10 months ago. Ever since I, I started reading books, I've enjoyed that sensation of, of finishing the last page of the book and, and closing the cover. My four-year-old is beginning to enjoy this as well as he's finished a few of his first chapter books. The satisfaction of a job being finished. But not every experience of finality is as enjoying as, as finishing a building project or finishing a good book. On Tuesday, this last week, I attended a funeral for a friend of mine, a retired pastor named Brian. It was at least the 15th funeral that I've attended in the last 15 months or so. This one had a pretty good turnout, but even so, the, the church was far from full. It made me think about a cultural observation that I made in passing last Sunday. How fewer and fewer families put on funerals anymore. How fewer and fewer people attend the ones that are put on. And how even fewer ever make it out to a cemetery. Why? Because of the terrible sense of finality in death. A finality that our increasingly worldly culture doesn't want to face. Our passage last week ended with a great stone being rolled across the entrance of the tomb in which Joseph of Arimathea had laid the dead body of Jesus with a terrible sense of finality. But Mark's gospel did not end with verse 47 of chapter 15. And that brings us to Mark, chapter 16, verse 1. I invite you to turn there now. You can find it on page 54 in the second half of the Pew Bible. It was Friday evening when the body of Jesus was sealed in that tomb. Saturday, the Sabbath, has come and gone, and it is now Sunday morning. Mark, chapter 16, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord to you. When the Sabbath was passed... Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb... They saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this record of the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Lord, help us to reflect upon the significance of these events for our lives and for our deaths. Bless the preaching of your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. These three women 
come with the intention of, of further anointing Jesus' body with spices. Clearly not, not thinking through the details of how on earth are they going to roll away that great stone. But they're grieving. And they're, they earnestly desire to do something to honor their crucified master. Note that they were clearly not expecting to find that he had risen. No one was expecting a resurrection. You likely recognize the names of these three women who first made this discovery. In chapter 15, verse 40, Mark noted that the three of them were looking on from a distance as Jesus breathed his last breath at 3 p.m. on Friday afternoon. And then in verse 47 of chapter 15, Mark noted that two of the three were there just a few hours later when the stone was rolled across the entrance of the tomb and they, quote, saw where he was laid. Now, at dawn on the third day, these are the ones who first encounter the empty tomb and the angelic figure who announces to them that he is not here, he has risen. The point of recording their names and what they saw is so that they may serve as eyewitnesses of his death, his burial, and his resurrection, showing that Jesus really did die, that he really was buried, and that he really did rise from that grave. It's the same point that the Apostle Paul is making in 1 Corinthians 15, the great resurrection chapter, as he writes, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at once, most of whom are still alive, writes Paul. Why note that most of the 500 brothers to whom Christ was, risen Christ appeared were still alive? at the time of Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians. Why note that? It's because Paul's original audience could go and track them down in Galilee to hear their eyewitness testimonies firsthand. Just as the first readers of Mark's gospel could go and track down Mary from Magdala and Mary, the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph and of their friend Salome and Joseph of Arimathea and Simon of Cyrene who carried Christ's cross, father of Alexander and Rufus. Real people with real names and a, a real story to tell. They knew what they had seen. Their testimony can be trusted. In the Apostle Paul's articulation of the gospel there in 1 Corinthians 15, that which is of first importance, notice how much space is given to the resurrection. Of course, the crucifixion is mentioned, but, but far more attention is given to the resurrection. I wonder how often you think about the literal, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I wonder how often you speak of the resurrection to others. And yet the resurrection is front and center in the preaching of the gospel in the rest of the New Testament. Have you ever noticed that? Spend some time this afternoon reading through the first recorded sermon in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, as the Apostle Peter at Pentecost preaches before a great gathering of Jews. And notice how much attention is given to the literal bodily resurrection of Christ from the dead. Having spoken about Christ's death, Peter declares, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And Peter then reads from a psalm of David, Psalm 16, and Peter declares, David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he, Christ, was not abandoned to Hades, nor did Christ's flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. The resurrection of Jesus was central to the preaching of the gospel of the first disciples. We see it in the street preaching of Peter in chapter 3 of Acts. In Solomon's portico, he declares, You killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. In chapter 4, Peter and John are hauled before the Sanhedrin, the court that was responsible for putting Christ to death. 
And Peter and John declare, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, God raised from the dead. In chapter 5, all of the apostles are then hauled before that same Sanhedrin with their lives clearly on the line, and they boldly and unashamedly declare, the God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so it continues throughout the early church. Why? Why such attention on Jesus' resurrection and not just his crucifixion? Why does the Apostle Paul write in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Wasn't it enough for Christ to die in my place? Why does Paul, while speaking of the only kind of faith that saves, write in, in Romans 4.24, righteousness will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Raised for our justification. Aren't we saved by Christ's substitutionary life and death in our place? Why was it so necessary for Jesus to actually rise from the dead? Can you answer that, Christian? In chapter 10 of Mark, after having foretold of his coming death and resurrection for the third time, Jesus declared, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. A ransom, it's the price that must be paid in order for a slave or a prisoner of war to be set free. You see, the price of our redemption, the price of our liberation was the life and death of God the Son in our place. He gave his life as a ransom for many. But the evidence, the proof that that ransom was accepted by the Father, well, the evidence was the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That's why Paul can say, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. But Christ has been raised. And with the discovery of that empty tomb on that first Easter Sunday, we can have confidence that it is finished. The price of our redemption has been paid, paid in full. All for whom Christ died have been ransomed from death. That is liberated, set free from the penalty of of sin. You see, that, that's what death is. It's the penalty of sin. Death is not normal. Death is not natural. And we know this. We feel this deep in our bones every time death touches or, or threatens the life of one of our loved ones. And especially every time we muster the courage to attend a funeral or visit a cemetery. We know this. In those moments, we know that this is not the way things are supposed to be. Death is part of the curse that human sin has brought upon God's good creation. But that empty tomb on that first Easter Sunday testifies that death has been emptied of its power. For Christ has risen from the dead, conquering death on our behalf. And though we too will taste death, we can have absolute confidence that we who have been united with Christ through faith, having confessed with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and having believed in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will likewise be raised from the dead on the last day, never to die again. For we have been ransomed from death. Full payment for our sin has already been made and accepted. It is finished. But that's not all. It's not merely that the grip of death and of eternal destruction from which we have been set free. It's also the enslaving grip of sin itself that we have been set free from. What most infuriated the religious leaders of Israel regarding Jesus, it was not just his renouncing of their man-made traditions such as those involving Sabbath rituals and hand-washing rituals, but rather what most infuriated them was his insistence that these religious rituals could do nothing to cleanse their hearts from sin. Not just the guilt of sin, but the grip of sin. 
That is something that only Jesus can do. And that infuriated them. But with his life and his death and his resurrection, Christ has not only purchased our liberation from the consequences of our sin in the future, he has purchased our liberation from our enslavement to sin here and now. We have been ransomed from death and we have been ransomed from slavery. We have been set free from the penalty of sin and we have been set free from the power of sin. That's why the imagery of a, of a new exodus, a new exodus, it dominates the gospel of Mark, especially in the opening passage. He's saying that as the Israelites were set free from bondage to their harsh taskmasters in Egypt, so too those bought by the blood of the Lamb have now been set free from bondage to our taskmaster of sin. With the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the new creation has dawned. Those who are in Christ are a new creation. Listen to how the Apostle Paul describes the resurrection power of Jesus at work within Christians in Romans chapter 6. He writes this. We were buried, therefore, with Jesus by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We know that our old self was crucified with him, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to, to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. For your, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you. That empty tomb on that first Easter Sunday, it testifies that our sin has been emptied of its power. For Christ has conquered sin on our behalf. The ransom has been paid. It is finished. So rise and walk in newness of life with him now and forevermore. But that's not all. There's more to see about this ransom that has been paid and accepted in our passage. Let's pick up again with the words of the angelic being in verse 6. We know he's an angel from the other Gospels. He said, Do not be alarmed, verse 7, but go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Now, if you knew nothing about the history of Christ and of his church. And all you had from the Bible was the Gospel of Mark. Upon reading this for the first time, you would be taken aback by those words. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. The implication being that he will meet with them there for fellowship and to further disciple them. But remember where we last saw the twelve disciples. The twelve had all deserted him in his hour of need. Peter, who is explicitly called out here, had denied him three times during Jesus' trial before the Sanhedrin. Yet even so, it's as Jesus had said back then when he foretold their desertion back in chapter 14. He had said, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. With those words of Jesus before they had fallen away, and the words of this angel afterwards, reconciliation is being offered to all sinners, even those who have fallen away from Christ after having claimed him as their Lord. If you have turned your back on Jesus through your words or through your deeds, if you have shown yourself to be ashamed of him and of his teaching, understand that reconciliation is still available for you as it was for them. The offer of forgiveness remains if you will receive him as your Lord. But one verse remains in the gospel. Having been commanded by an angel to go and tell this good news of Christ's resurrection to others, we read this in verse 8. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. 
And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Their fear is understandable. Throughout Mark's gospel, a, a response of fear and bewilderment to the power of God manifested in Jesus has been a common theme. In chapter 4, after calming a storm, his disciples, quote, were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? In chapter 5, those who observed the garrison demoniac, now healed by Jesus, just sitting there clothed and in his right mind, well, those who saw that were afraid. Later in chapter 5, the woman with the bleeding problem, after touching Jesus' robe and being healed, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him. In chapter 6, he came to his disciples walking on the water of the sea, and they all saw him and were terrified. In chapter 9, he's transfigured before Peter, John, and James, revealing his divine glory, and they did not know what to say, for they were terrified. The fear of these three women fleeing from the gaping entrance of that empty tomb is understandable. But I wonder if it strikes you as an odd way to end this gospel record, especially since Mark hasn't mentioned any of the appearances of the risen Christ that we found elsewhere. Now, you might be saying, wait a minute, Pastor, in my Bible I, I see 12 more verses. Well, if, if you do, hopefully they're placed in brackets with a footnote explaining why they shouldn't be there. If that's troubling to you, come back next week as I hope to talk more about what's going on with those verses then, if not next Sunday morning, then next Sunday evening at 4.30. For now, just, just reason with me about what's not in brackets. Mark's gospel ends with these women trembling and afraid. And because of that fear, quote, they said nothing to anyone. It's quite an abrupt end to his gospel. It's quite different from the endings of the other three gospels. But then again, so is the beginning of Mark's gospel. Unlike the other three, Mark just jumps right in with the adult Jesus appearing on the scene after John the Baptist. Nothing about angels foretelling or announcing his birth. Nothing about the virgin conception or the infant king being born in a lowly manger. Mark just gets right to the public ministry of Jesus. And as abruptly as Mark began his gospel, so he abruptly concludes his gospel. And he concludes with, with a common theme that he has been developing. Not just the theme of fear, of beholding divine power breaking into this world, but the theme of not telling others about Jesus. Step back and, and consider the gospel as a whole. The very first words of Mark's gospel declare Jesus to be the long-promised Messiah, the Son of God. But then the rest of the gospel is all about people gradually coming to understand who Jesus is. The demons recognize who he is right away, and upon falling down before Jesus, they cry out, You are the Son of God! And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. At the end of chapter 1, after one of his first healing miracles, he commands the healed leper to see that you say nothing to anyone. He commands silence. At the end of chapter 7, after healing a deaf and mute man, Jesus charged those who were there to tell no one, commanding silence. At the end of chapter 8, for the first time, a human being, Peter, confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus strictly charged the disciples to tell no one about him commanding silence, at which point Jesus then began to correct the disciples' misconceptions regarding what he, as the Messiah, had come to achieve. For he had not come to liberate Israel from Roman oppression, he had come to die and to rise again. And that call for silence was only meant to be temporary, until his death and resurrection made clear the kind of Messiah that he was, the kind of liberation he had come to bring, and the means by which he was bringing that liberation. Jesus made this point clear in chapter 9. After having been transfigured before Peter, John, and James, as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until, until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. With the discovery of that empty tomb on that first Easter Sunday, the time for silence was over. And yet, out of fear, they said nothing to anyone. The question for the reader of Mark's gospel is not 
Will these women take courage and speak of what they have seen and heard? Obviously they did, or this book wouldn't have been written. We wouldn't be reading it today if these first disciples hadn't opened their mouths to speak. No, by ending with the line, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The question that Mark is posing to the reader is not, will these women take courage and speak of what they have seen and heard? It's, will you take courage and open your mouth to speak of Jesus to others? This is the charge that has been building ever since Jesus' hard words at the end of chapter 8 which we keep returning. Chapter 8, verse 34. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. We must boldly and unashamedly open our mouths to speak of Jesus to others. This theme of opening our mouths, it reached its penultimate climax in in last week's passage when Joseph of Arimathea, a so-called secret disciple of Jesus, overcame his fear of the Jews and came out of the shadows and asked for permission to give Jesus a proper burial. And now with the concluding words of this gospel, this theme reaches its ultimate climax. The time for silence is over. Those united to Christ by faith have been ransomed from death, ransomed from slavery, and ransomed from fear. Yes, firstly, the fear of death and the fear of judgment on the last day, but also the fear of opening your mouths to speak about Jesus here and now. And this relates to to another universal fear, fear, the fear of insignificance, the fear of living a life that doesn't matter in the end. You see, if God became a man to live and to die and to rise from the dead in your place, and if he is continuing to sustain your life here on earth while glory awaits you in death, and if he is empowering you to overcome the power of sin every day, he's doing so for a reason, beloved. And in setting you free from the fear of speaking to others about Jesus, as we see so clearly him doing in the lives of the first disciples in the book of Acts. You are being set free from insignificance. You are being set free from the pointlessness of sin, from the purposelessness of a life of sin. For we have all been given a purpose, and it is to go and tell others this glorious news of the empty tomb. I believe that Mark ends his gospel without recording any of the subsequent appearances of the risen Christ, because in the same way that Christ had not yet visibly appeared to these women, neither has Christ visibly appeared to us. And yet, as the expectation for them was to receive the testimony that they had heard but not seen, and to go and tell others, so too the expectation for us is to receive the testimony that we have heard but not seen and go and tell others likewise. Tell of what you have heard. Tell of what you have experienced in having all your guilt and your shame washed clean. Tell of what you have experienced in being given power over sins that once enslaved you. And let his resurrection power be seen in your ability to overcome the fear that would otherwise keep you silent. Jesus' work to ransom us from death and slavery and fear, Jesus' work is finished. The life's work of my faithful pastor friend Brian, whose funeral I attended on Tuesday, is finished. And I know that his master has said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. But for those of us in this room today, our work to continue to share the good news of Christ with all the world is not yet finished. So let us diligently seek the satisfaction that comes with a job being finished, that we may hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. Father, help us to rejoice in the words, He is not here, He has risen. 
and help us likewise rejoice in the following words, to go and tell this glorious news to others. Help us to rejoice in having been given a mission and thus a purpose. Bless the preaching of your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.